All right. Now, if you have your Bibles, please take them out and turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and while you're turning, I have to tell you, I think this is the first time in 20 years I've ever given a public movie endorsement, and I just want to challenge you. If you haven't seen Jesus Revolution yet, this is one of the most amazing movies. Go ahead, if you've seen it. How many of you have seen it? Wow, it's great. Really, this is an amazing movie. We went and saw it this last Tuesday night. AMC has half price on Tuesdays, right? But it's at AMC 16. And actually, it was only supposed to play for about a week, but it's been extended. Last week, it was the third highest grossing movie. A complete surprise to everybody in Hollywood. And if you haven't seen it, it is the biographical story of both Chuck Smith and Greg Laurie. Chuck was the pastor who founded the Calvary Chapel churches in California. Greg Laurie is a current pastor today and got saved and brought up in that ministry and has been serving in it for years and years. And not only is it an incredible movie about how God reaches, touches, and saves everyone from every walk of life, but what was interesting for me was that it also provides really a historical context for things that were happening in the 70s, both in our culture in general, as well as movements within the church. Uh, if you saw it, you know at the end is the movement, the, what was the spiritual revival of that early period in 1970, 71, and 72. The movie ends with the Dallas Billy Graham crusade. I was there. That's how old I am. No, <laughs> seriously. I was at, and it was called Explo 72. Our high school youth group went. And at the time, I just thought, oh, great. Our youth group's going to Dallas. We're going to, Billy Graham crusade. That's kind of cool. But it really wasn't until I watched this movie and got a historical context for how big and important that Dallas crusade was. But if you haven't seen it, it's going to be there at least for one more week at AMC. I just looked it up, and there are times, if you haven't got anything going on today, head down to the theater and take a, take a watch of this. It's really, really one of the best movies. In fact, I heard about it, and, and uh, I honestly think it's the best Christian movie that I've seen yet. And... I was watching TV a couple, about two weeks ago, and I saw Kelsey Grammer on an interview, and the person said, well, what did this movie mean to you? And he just started crying. It was so powerful. I'm looking at Kelsey Grammer, this famous actor, and he just starts crying, and he said, it's impossible to put it into words. And playing this role of Chuck Smith, and he said, after the movie was done, people came to me and said, oh, Chuck Smith was my pastor. He married us. He baptized me. He did. And he just is crying. And I thought, for him to be this moved by a movie that he was in, thinking it's the best movie or television program he's ever been a part of. I'm thinking, this is Cheers, Frasier, all these big shows that he's been a part of. And this is the single movie that he's the most proud of. Wow. So I was, honestly, I was looking forward to seeing this, and I was, this is a, clearly a two-bucket of popcorn movie, so I, <laughs> like this, so. All right, that's enough. If you get a chance and you want to watch it, I really encourage you to go see that, all right? Now, we're in James chapter 1, and we're picking up again in our series of loving God and loving others, and as we've been going through this for the last couple of weeks, I've shared with you everything in this book is all about what it means and how we are to express our love for God and our love for others. When you look at chapter one, it's all loving God, loving God, loving God. And in order to be able to prepare us for that, last week and the week before, we were addressing the issue of what it actually means to be in relationship with the God who loves us. 
And I shared that there are two critical principles, and we're going to keep coming back to these. And by the time that we finish chapter one, I hope they're drilled in, because in order for us to be able to properly express our love for God, the first principle is before we can even properly express our love to God, we have to make sure that we are in relationship with God as our heavenly father. See, if you go through chapter one with all these demands, these expectations, and you're not in relationship with God, chapter one just becomes a set of rules, period. We cannot express love for God unless we're in relationship with him. And then the second principle that I shared with you last week is that our willingness to express God, our willingness to express love to God is going to be directly dependent upon our degree of love or how much we love God. In other words, the more we love God, the easier our expressions of love will be. All right? So, having understood that, now we can come to the nine great expressions of love that are written about in chapter one. Last week, we looked at the first two, that we would be faithful in testing and that we would be asking God for wisdom. And I shared with you at the end of the message, it was my intention that we were going to cover the next three today, which would be celebrating relationship over riches, resisting temptation, and being appreciative of grace. But to be honest with you, as I was preparing this week, what we're going to cover is so big and so important today that we're only going to get through two of them. Next week, we'll come back and pick up on appreciating grace. But this morning, we're looking at the third and the fourth expression of our love, which is celebrating relationship over riches and resisting temptation. So in verses 9 through 11, we have this issue of our expressing love to God by celebrating relationship over riches. James does this in the most incredible way when in verse 9, he says, believers, he's talking about you and me. Now remember, in first century Israel, they didn't have three social classes like we have today. Here in America and in the West, you have the upper class, those who are very wealthy. We have a middle class where most of us fit into. And then we have the lower class, the very poor. In first century Israel, there were only two classes, the haves and the have-nots. You were either a wealthy landowner or you were a worker, a laborer, and poor. And so he doesn't try to address three social classes as we would have here, but rather he just deals with the two. And he says, believers who are in the lower class, those who are in humble circumstances. He writes to them and says, if you're a believer who lives in the lower class, the humble, lowly circumstances, you should be taking pride. And this is really interesting because as I do with so many of these studies, we look at the tense and understand something that isn't always communicated in our English translation. And the verb take is in the present imperative tense. As an imperative verb, it's not a suggestion or an option. It is a command. Do this. And as a present tense verb, the little tilde mark represents the present tense, which means we're supposed to do it all the time. It's not just occasional or when I feel like it or when things are going well. I am to every single day. Over and over, it's to be a habitual part of my life. I am be, to be taking pride. And it's so interesting that the New Living Translation uses the word boasting. See, taking pride and boasting are essentially the same thing. You can be boasting verbally about something. You can't stop talking about it or... By taking pride, you're simply boasting inside your head. 
But this is what I focus on. This is what I enjoy. This is what I celebrate in my life. Believers in lowly circumstances ought to be constantly taking pride or boasting, whether externally, verbally, or internally, in their high position. Well, what is the high position? It's our relationship with Christ. Our relationship with God through Christ. And he says, this is what's really worth celebrating. This is what's really worth taking pride or talking about. And then he comes at the rich in the next verse. And he says, now you in the upper class, you who are rich, should be taking pride. Same, same tenses. It's the present imperative. You should be always taking pride or boasting about your humiliation. Now, that sounds kind of odd, doesn't it? You should be proud of your humiliation. And that is a spiritual recognition that what you have materially really has no value in who you are. Because everything that we have, from a monetary, material perspective, it's all going to go. It's all going to go. It fades away like a flower in the field. And he makes this point when he says the sun rises, it has scorching heat, it withers the plant and the blossom falls and the beauty's gone. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. I mean, let's be honest. We get a house, we get a car, and we're so excited about that. We get all the technology. And at the moment, man, it is so cool. It's so beautiful in our lives. We look at this. And then all of a sudden, next year, a new model comes out. And our pride in this technology or the car or whatever, it starts to fade. Even as we watch it and drive it and use it, it's fading all the time. But for the rich, it's easy for us to find our sense of value in the things that we have. And remember, when we talk about rich and poor, in America, even the poorest Americans, the poorest Americans, are still in the top 3% of global wealth. But our culture teaches us to find our identity and our value in what we have rather than who we are. Oh, you have a whatever kind of car, truck, seems so important at the moment. Oh, you have whatever size TV is current and best. Oh, you have our portfolio, whatever it might be. Everything in our media, everything, in our media drives us and trains us and tells us that we find our value and our identity in what we have rather than who we are. But it's because of this, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, that we are to teach the rich, and we are all rich by global standards. Every one of us, again, even the poorest Americans are rich In this world, he says, tell the rich in this world not to be proud, not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Banks crash. Stocks drop in value. Companies go bankrupt. Technology breaks. It's outdated. Things are stolen. And all of a sudden, what happens to our identity and our value then if it's gone? And it's so easy for us, as Americans especially, to be able to look at the things that we go, and there is this sense of, whether it's verbal or just in our head, we're taking pride, we're boasting, yeah, yeah, that's a pretty good car, that's a pretty good truck, that's a pretty good, whatever it might be. And we think, I am good, I am valuable, I find my identity because I was able to buy that. Paul says again, really? Really? 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What do you have that God hasn't given to you? And if everything that you have is from God, 
Why are you bragging about that? Why are you taking pride in that as if it really weren't a gift? That it's because of you, how smart you are, how great you are, what a good saver you are, what a wise negotiator you are. Really? Really? This is how the world thinks. This is everything that is natural to our culture. And yet, Christ calls us to be countercultural people. James is telling us We need to think differently than the world does around us. If you're wealthy, don't take pride in your wealth. Don't be bragging. Don't don't see your wealth as what gives you identity. And if you're poor, that's okay. That's okay. Because worldly wealth, natural wealth, it's all going to fade anyways. Where we find our fulfillment, where we find our value, where we find our identity is not in material things, but rather in spiritual things. Douglas Moo, great prophet, Wheaton, writes and says, rich and poor alike, as he's addressing this issue from James, the rich and the poor alike must evaluate themselves. They must find their fulfillment, their value, and their identity by spiritual rather than material standards. We celebrate relationship. Look, who I am in Christ is worth a lot more than anybody with all the toys, all the stuff of the world. You may be the poorest guy sitting in this room, but if you have Christ, you are richer than Elon Musk. It's that simple. Because our identity and our value is wrapped up in Jesus. In fact, to make sure that that we understand this, God presents this both as an Old and a New Testament principle. And in Jeremiah chapter 9, God is speaking through Jeremiah to his covenant people and says, don't let the wise man boast in their wisdom or the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches. But those who want to boast, those who want to take Pride in something should boast in this one thing alone, and that is that they truly know me. The word know is the Hebrew word yada. Yada. It isn't academic awareness, it's not reading a book and knowing about a person, but it is an experiential relational knowledge. It is an intimate knowledge that. Only two people who know each other in a personal relationship can enjoy. It represents the closest and the most intimate kind of relationships that we can have. You ever heard anyone say, yada, yada, yada? Right? That's the word, yada. And God says, if you want to celebrate something, if you want to take pride in something, if you want to boast about it, whether it's verbal or just in your head, what you can really boast about is this one thing, that you know that you are in relationship with the God who loves and that you understand, I'm the Lord. So how do we do that? How do we celebrate relationship over riches? Jesus gives us the answer. And he says very simply, it's a love thing. It's a love thing. In fact, to make sure that we understand this contrast between taking our pride and getting our value and our identity from the riches of the world instead of Christ, he says, listen, understand this. What you treasure, what you take pride in, what you boast about the most is what you love the most. It's a love thing. And no one can serve two masters. No one can love two masters. For you're either going to hate the one and love the other, or you're going to be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't compartmentalize your life. You can't love or serve both God and money. And so, 
If we are going to celebrate relationship, we have to be in relationship with the God who loves us. And in order for us to be able to freely celebrate the relationship that we have in Christ, which is so amazing, so wonderful, so eternal, the degree that I love God is going to be exactly reflected in how I praise him, in how I celebrate my relationship with him. I want to challenge you. If you find your identity, if you think your value is coming from what you have rather than what you are in Christ, God wants to change your way of thinking. God wants to help you reevaluate and reconstruct your perspective on life so that you can adequately celebrate him. But then after addressing that, and this is so cool as you go through, it's almost like looking at a string of pearls. Each one of these things, these expressions of God are in themselves just a very important thing, but they are all strung together because they all reflect these expressions of love. Now after dealing with celebrating relationship over riches, he pushes us to the next issue, which is that we're going to learn how to resist temptation. Resisting temptation. And he does this in the most powerful way when in verse 13, James writes and says, when someone's tempted, no one, no one can say, God is tempting me. All right, now let's hit the pause button for a second. You remember last week when we were talking about the issue of being strong and faithful in times of trial. I shared with you that the word trial is the word parasmos, and parasmos really is the same word as tempt, which is perazo. It's different forms of the word, but essentially the same word. But they have opposite meanings. A trial is something that God allows into my life. He ordains, he puts in front of me to challenge me and to bring spiritual maturity. Tempting is exactly the opposite. It is not something that God puts in our path, but rather it is something that comes up through the vehicle of either the world, the flesh, or the devil that is intended to pull me away from God. The only similarity between trials and temptations is that they both represent a challenge, a spiritual challenge in my life. Same word, opposite meanings, but the same motivation. It's a challenge. And when someone is challenged with a temptation, and remember, it's the context that determines whether what's talking about is a trial or a temptation. Very clearly, in verses two and three and four, it was all about trials of our faith, but now he switches to the issue of temptations that are designed to pull us away from God. When tempted, no one can say, God is tempting me. God is the one who's doing this. Someone once said, to err is human, but to blame it on God is even more human. God, this is your fault. You're the one who allowed this to happen in my life. You're the one who created me. God, you made me this way. With all my needs, all my desires, if you hadn't made me this way, I wouldn't be struggling with this. This concept of blaming God and saying, it's your fault, you made me this way, was perfectly described by the Scottish poet Robert Burns. And while the English is a little different from the way we say things, I think you'll get the point. When Burns said, thou knowest that thou hast formed me with passions wild and strong, and listening to their witching voice has often led me wrong. Is there a single person in this room who hasn't experienced the challenge and the struggle of temptation, the witching voice that impacts these wild and strong passions that we have? No, of course not. All of us have sinned and fall, glory of the, uh, fall short of the glory of God. And what's so interesting, when Paul writes in Romans and says that we've all fallen short, 
It's in a present tense, not a past tense verb. And it means we all keep on struggling. We keep on falling short because temptation is a part of every one of our lives in this room. And every person who is a believer still struggles with the issue of temptation. And James writes to every one of us as believers who struggle with temptation and says, listen, understand, when you are tempted, you can't say that God is the one who's tempting me. And he gives us two reasons. The first one is because God can't be tempted by evil. And the second is neither does God ever tempt anyone. God cannot be tempted by evil, and he never tempts anyone. Now, we have no struggle with the second issue. Neither does he tempt anyone. God never, ever is the one who's bringing the temptation. He always brings trials and allows them into our lives, but he never, ever is responsible for the temptations that are designed to pull us away from him. But here's where we struggle And that is the issue theologically that God can't be tempted. Now, it may surprise you to know that there are actually three separate ways that you can legitimately, grammatically translate this phrase, God cannot be tempted. And this has been a challenging point of theology for literally 2,000 years. In fact, when Pastor Kenny was having his ordination just a couple of months ago, this was a major topic of discussion that Ken had to be able to defend, as every pastor has to deal with when he's going through an ordination process. And when we're talking about theology, can God be tempted? Now, the traditional translation is that God can't be tempted. Almost every translation presents it that way. And the concept behind that is that God has no sin nature and therefore he has no platform to be tempted. He cannot be solicited to sin because he is completely holy, righteous. There is no sin nature that would even allow him to sin. And if I asked you, is this your understanding? I would say that probably most of you would raise your hand and say, yes, everything that I understand, God can't be tempted, period. I'd say, okay, I understand that. But if that's the case, if that's the proper translation of this verse, what do we do with Jesus? I mean this very seriously. What do we do with Jesus? Because in Mark chapter 4 and Luke 4, Jesus, at the beginning of his earthly ministry, goes into the desert and he's there for 40 days. He hasn't eaten anything, and at the end of the 40 days, he is desperately hungry. And what happened? Come on, you know the story. Satan came and tempted Jesus. Were the temptations not real? Or can Jesus, and who's going to argue? Jesus is God, right? Jesus is God. And suddenly he's experiencing temptation as he's never had to deal with it before. See, in God's eternal state, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit exists through all eternity before the world or anything else is ever created. God is completely self-existent and self-sustaining. He needs nothing, absolutely nothing. He can exist forever without anything but the Godhead. But then something changes. God takes on humanity. Jesus, God, becomes human and one with us. And for the first time in all eternity past, Jesus, God, feels things, needs things, and wants things 
that he never had to experience before. After 40 days, he's hungry. Satan comes to him so subtly and just says, hey, you're hungry? Why don't you turn the stones to bread? And suddenly it's a temptation that is real because it would satisfy a need or a desire that Jesus has and he is capable of doing this. This wouldn't be a temptation to any of us. If we were there and we had been in the desert for 40 days, we would be hungry. And if Satan came and said, Steve, why don't you just turn the stone to bread? It might satisfy a need, but I have no capability to be able to do this. I can't turn the stone to bread, but Jesus could. It suddenly becomes real and possible for him, and it would satisfy a need. And it isn't the issue of the sin nature that becomes the platform, but rather humanity. If it was a sin nature issue, how do we explain what happened to Adam and Eve, who had no sin nature until after the fall? But Jesus has humanity that has needs and desires. And the temptation was to fulfill that need or desire in a way that is outside of God's best for him in that moment. And what do we do with a verse like Hebrews 4.15 that says, we have a high priest referring to Jesus and every translation says exactly the same thing. It's not trial, but rather temptation. Context is everything for this verse and for the word parodsmo. He said, it's not just that Jesus went through every trial that we experience and he was successful, but the context is clearly related to sin. He was tempted in every way that we are and yet did not sin. And he becomes then the model for us. So the first translation is that God can't be tempted. But the second translation, which is equally legitimate grammatically, and I think actually the better in the context of theology in both the Old and the New Testaments, is that the temptations are real because they meet desires and are attainable. But God would not, Jesus could but would not sin. And he is completely untouched. And that's where the translation comes in. Not just that God can't be tempted, but he is untouched by temptation. Again, he was tempted in every way that we are, and yet would not give in to the temptation. He would not sin. The Christian Standard Bible is the only one that translates it with this second, legitimate, grammatically correct way of saying it. For God is not, not can't be, but is not tempted by evil. He is untouched by temptations. And I actually think that this is the better translation. Now, I shared with you, there are, there are actually three different translations. The third one is that he ought not. And the same verb is used in other passages to say you shouldn't do this. But in this context, in this discussion, the ought not really isn't even fit. It's really just whether God can't be tempted or he can, as we saw in Jesus, but he is completely untouched by the temptations. All right? Have I given you something to talk about at lunch? All right. This is really challenging because in being tempted just like us and yet choosing not to sin, Jesus becomes the pattern for our lives. And James warns us what happens if we don't observe the pattern that was set by Jesus and follow it. And he does this by saying, this is what happens in the process of being tempted. And he gives us two very important and significant illustrations of the temptation process. The first one is using a marauding beast that's eating up and dragging away uh, another animal. He said, instead, when a person is tempted, they are dragged away by their own evil desires. All right, now, here's where you gotta let me 
help you again understand from a teaching perspective, there is a challenge in every form of translation from one language to another. It doesn't matter whether going from English to Spanish, Spanish to German, German to French, or any other language. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about the Bible or anything else. Whenever you translate from one language to another, there are two critical issues. The first is how literal the translation should be. What does the, pers- what does the original statement say? And then the second issue is how to make that readable or understandable in the receiving language. Because in some original languages, they simply don't have a word for it in the receiving language. Or they have idioms that are completely misunderstood when you, and have no meaning when you get to the second language. And so there is always a challenge going from one language to the next about the literalness versus the readability or understandability. We see that happen here. Because when he writes and says that everyone is dragged away by their own evil desire, if I was able to show you this in the Greek language, the word evil isn't there. It just isn't there. What James actually wrote was that people are dragged away by their desires. And the Greek word is epithumia. Epithumia just means desires. And it's the context that determines how you respond to those desires and the impact that they have. It might surprise you to know that this exact same word, that being dragged away by your epithumia, is the same word that Jesus used in Luke 22 when he's with his disciples eating the Passover, saying, you know what, I have earnestly, eagerly desired, epithumia, to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Who's going to suggest that Jesus had an evil desire here? It's not going to happen. Just, it's desires. We all have needs and desires. And we are dragged away when those desires and needs are uncontrolled. The second word picture that James gives us about the process of temptation is when he writes and says in verse 14, instead of being dragged away. Oh, by the way, let me just say, before we jump into the second one, listen, So many times people just hear the word, and in some translations, it's the word lust. Oh, that's just sensuality, sexuality issues. But it's not. It can be any desire that we have that we struggle with that's uncontrolled. In fact, Dietrich Bonhoeffer addresses this better than anybody else when he says, with irresistible power, desire, desire for anything, anything that would be a legitimate need, interest, or or want. With irresistible power, desire seizes mastery over the flesh in this moment. And it makes no difference whether it's sexual desire, ambition, vanity, desire for revenge, love of fame and power, or greed for money. All desires, we all have them. They all come out at different times in different circumstances. And when the desire takes control of us, Whatever it might be, joy in God is extinguished in us and we seek all of our joy in the creature, in the moment. It's my life. I deserve this. I want this. I'm going to satisfy myself. And in that moment, it's not that God suddenly disappears, but he becomes quite unreal to us. He loses all reality. And the only desire of this person who's being dragged away in the moment it's real. This is all that's real to me in the moment. And notice the next sentence Satan doesn't have to fill us with hatred for God in that moment. It just fills us with forgetfulness of God. I'm not thinking about God in this moment of temptation as I'm being dragged away. All I'm thinking about is the satisfaction I'm going to experience because it'll meet a desire. And the lust aroused envelops the mind and the will of men and women in deepest darkness. And the powers of clear discrimination 
of spiritual decision are taken from us because we are being dragged away by our uncontrolled desire. And the questions present themselves. Is this what the flesh really, uh, is what the flesh desires really sin in this moment, in this case? Is it really not permitted for me? Yes, expect it of me right now. Don't I deserve it? I want it. Here in this moment, this particular situation, this temptation, shouldn't I be able to appease or satisfy my desire? And it's in that moment, as we give ourselves over to the temptation, we are dragged away and everything rises up against the word of God in me. And we've all been there. We've all been there. And it's easy to look at somebody and say, oh, that person's sin was worse than mine. No. The desire might have been different in the moment. You might have had a different desire than they did. But it's the yielding to the desire that is uncontrolled in my life that becomes sin. There's no one better or worse in here. We're all fallen creatures. We continue to struggle with these issues. You can't look at anyone else and say, well, mine was better or worse than somebody else's. It's all the same. It's all the same. And having understood that, James says, okay, here's here's the second picture of the process of, temp- gener- uh, of temptation. And he presents it as a second generation point when he says, after uncontrolled desire is conceived, it has a baby, and that baby is sin. It gives birth to sin. And then sin grows up and becomes an adult. And when sin is full grown, it has a baby, and it gives birth to death. And so this is the process that happens in every one of our lives. It looks like this. We all have needs and desires. And those needs and desires are God-given. No problem with that. But it's the issue of whether or not we control them and uncontrolled needs and desires are let go and temptations appear. They become the platform for the temptation. And when we decide that we want that thing more than we want God, we give ourselves over to it and then sin brings death. John Piper describes this process by saying all the evils in the world come not because our desires for happiness are too strong, but because they're so weak that we're willing to settle for the fleeting pleasures that do not satisfy our deepest souls. But rather in the end, they destroy us. We've all heard the name Marcus Antonius Mark Antony is how we know him best. He lived from 83 to 30 BC. And as you study the history books, you'll see that Mark Antony was a brilliant general in the Roman army. He was one of Rome's greatest generals. He was also one of the most talented of all the orders and statesmen of Rome. He was by nature just an incredible person who is uniquely gifted in everything that he did. But as you also study his life, you find out that he was one of the weakest men, both strongest and weakest. In fact, one historian said about Mark Antony, Antony was a colossal child as an adult. He was a colossal child, capable of conquering the whole world, but incapable of resisting a pleasure or his desires. And in the end, Antony died because of his undisciplined, uncontrolled passions. Wow. And that's exactly what Solomon writes about in Proverbs 14, 12, when he's writing to us as believers, saying there's a path before each person that seems right in the moment. 
my passions, my desires, but if they are uncontrolled, I give them over and I'm dragged off into this sin, it brings death. Now, we can look back at Genesis and say, yes, God said, if you eat this fruit that's forbidden, you will die. And we understand the bigger issue of death because of sin. But what does that mean in our personal lives? On any given day, if you and I give in to the temptations, does that mean we automatically die? No, but rather death here represents that when we come back to our senses, there's a sense of guilt, a sense of shame, a loss of God's relational presence in our lives. And we feel like we've died. So we're running out of time and I need to pull this together. How do we solve the problem? How do we overcome the power of natural desires that give a platform to temptation and sin? Is it enough, as Nancy Reagan said in the 80s with her, say no to drugs, just say no. Is that really enough? The answer is no, absolutely not. It may delay the issue a little bit, but it doesn't resolve the temptation issue in our lives. As you study the scripture, there is only one ultimate solution to having victory over temptation and sin. The only thing that will give us a long-term solution is that we love God more than we love ourselves that we love God's desires for our lives more than we love our own desires. Again, Piper puts it this way, I know of no other way to triumph over sin long term than to gain a distaste for it because of the superior satisfaction, the superior greater love that we have for God. That's it. It's a love thing. It's a love thing. And if we love God, we will express that by resisting temptation and saying no. Not just no to sin, but yes to God. And the model for us is Job, and this is where we'll end today. Job is this incredible man. He went through all these different trials and challenges. He loses his family. He loses his property. He loses his cattle, his money, and finally his health. The trials that God deliberately allowed him to experience then became a platform for temptation when his wife came and said, Job, what are you doing? Holding on to faithfulness to God. Just curse God and die. That's the kind of babe I want to marry, don't you? Hey, just give it up. But isn't it interesting that in the discussion that God had with Satan before the testing began, in chapter 2, verse 3, God said of Job that he was a man of complete integrity. Why? Because he reveres, he revels in his relationship with God and that causes him to stay away from sin. That's the kind of life that I want to live, don't you? Yeah. We revere, we revel in our relationship with God, and we are committed to letting the Holy Spirit control our passions. I am so glad, and if you're here and you've struggled with this issue, I can't close without saying... I am so grateful for the grace of God, the mercy of God that covers all of our sins. When we confess our sins, he's faithful. He's just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he says, now let's start again. Let's start again. And if you're here today and you're still wrestling with that guilt or shame, God says, no, come on. If you've confessed it, it's forgiven, it's completely put behind me, now let's start again. God never puts temptation in our way. He never gives us temptation, but rather he gives us good things, and that's where we're going to pick up next week when we come back and we start celebrating grace, grace, the good gifts that God has given us, all right? Let's pray.